And I really want to explore here um, the question of, you know, why should you as farmers be thinking about native biodiversity? And, and, and obviously, you know, one of the strong reasons is, is this regulatory, um, regulatory um, pressure that's coming on at the moment um, through councils. But there are other reasons as well. And actually, the next slide um, just gives you some quotes from, from four different farmers, um, one, one down a little bit further south than here, but just different reasons. I just use this to really illustrate the diversity of reasons why farmers I've talked to have got engaged in biodiversity. So this first farmer um, explained how um, he'd been in England, he'd been amazed, from Southland, he'd been amazed by how diverse the farms were he was visiting there, came back home and there wasn't a native species to be seen anywhere. And, and um, was, was quite, um, quite shocked by that. And so he started planting these, this is on his farm here, these beautiful um, shelter belts of native broadleaf um, to try and bring a bit of, bit, bit of diversity back into his farm. Um, another farmer up, up, up near where I live um, said, said he'd been talking to his um, bank manager and the bank manager said, look, if you start thinking about biodiversity, have a biodiversity plan, it's probably going to improve the resale um, value of your of, of your farm, and I've heard people talk about that some of the banks are now offering you know, interest reductions if, you've, if you're moving down to, into biodiversity and, and, and things like that. A dairy farmer on the coast said to me about um, how they'd lost or they kept losing cows into this gully, um, and so it seemed logical to them to um, fence the gully off, and then they were just blown away by how, how beautiful it became when they took the cattle out of it. Um, they didn't lose the cows and they had a lovely, a lovely gully. And I was up in the wire wrapper recently and a farmer said the same thing about um, lambing ewes. They decided to fence off these steep gullies because the, the ewes kept getting down there and then the lambs would get stuck and they'd be lost and it just wasn't worth it. Um, and then I work a lot with high country farmers and, and the comment there is it's often about the intergenerational story. They, they, they value the tussock grasslands and the shrublands and, and they see it as part of their legacy, their heritage for the next generation. So there, there are a wide range of reasons as to why farmers um, do engage with biodiversity. I think, and to me as an ecologist, I suppose, you know, one, one, of, the, one of the really amazing things is that you guys are custodians of some remarkable biodiversity. You know, on your farms you have some amazing plants and animals and you often have all that remains in an area. And I was blown away when you took me up the gully before. I mean it's awesome up there. It's, it's a really amazing um, gully that's on your farm. Um, we, we did some work for beef and lamb a few years ago and we showed that about 25%, a quarter of all of the native vegetation that remains in New Zealand is on sheep and beef farms. That's a significant chunk of it. And about and of half of that, about one and a half million hectares, is woody. It's forest. It might be cut over or modified or it might be regenerating, but it's woody vegetation. And what was particularly evident when we did that analysis is that often um, the forest that's on sheep and beef farms is in parts of the country where there's no other forest. That's it. There might be the odd dotted reserve and, and there's nothing else. So, so you, you folk really are custodians of some remarkable biodiversity. And it's not just the trees and the grasses and, and, and the harakiki and, and the plants, but it's all the animals that also are associated with that. And, you know, we couldn't manage kiwi in Northland um, without all the forest on private land. Um, you know, we need that forest. It provides connectivity so kiwi can move between larger patches. Um, things like the velvet worm peripetus there on the right, you know, it, it's often found on farmland. And, of course, all of our mobile birds like tui and keteru. When we were driving up there before, a keteru flew past it. A great rate of knots. And, I mean, that, that, those birds are part of our landscape because of what's on your farm. So, so you know, it's definitely important for its own sake. But it also adds value to your farming business, and it can add value in, in lots of obvious and, and less obvious ways. And, and I'm not going to spend very long on this because it's a subject of a different presentation, really, because we could spend a long time talking about it. But just some of the diversity of ways. I mean, there are direct benefits. I mean, the idea of you know, enhancing access to banking facilities, improving resale value is becoming a real reason for thinking about biodiversity. Native plants can do the same thing that exotic plants can do, you know, shade and shelter, but they can also provide those other benefits, you know, food for native birds and, and things like that. Um, we'll talk about carbon credits a bit more in a few minutes, minutes but there's, there's the opportunity to earn some income from native vegetation. Um, it can, of course, be a source for tourism, for timber, for honey. Um, well, the honey's not so um, valuable at the moment, but there are a range of other um, values associated with it. And I think particularly these days, um, market access is becoming a really big one. I'll come back to that in a minute. So that, they are all direct benefits that biodiversity can, can add to your farming business, but there's also all those indirect benefits, you know, the, the aesthetic value, the fact that the kōwhai is beautiful when it's flowering, just adds to that farm, that farm landscape. 
opportunities for, for hunting, for recreation, part of that intergenerational story, and increasingly part of your social license. You know, your, your wider community drives down the roads, they look across your fence, they see what you're doing, and, and it's part of that, that social license. And, and I, I, th I think all of this restoration that's occurring in New Zealand today, I think the, the urban people who are going out there will be noticing that and they'll be realising that actually farmers do care about biodiversity. So I think it is part of that, that story. And just to sort of touch on this, this market thing a little bit more, you know, at the moment, um, in terms of our marketing, we, we're starting to tell stories around carbon. So Silverfern Farms have their Carbon Zero meat. Fonterra have a Carbon Zero milk brand. Um, and I'm sure there are others doing it. The uh, fine wool industry through the Merino Company has been uh, developing its regenerative index, ZQRX. And they're all around telling stories to a market about how we're looking after our land, how we're managing our land. And I think biodiversity is going to become an increasingly important part of that. The interesting dilemma or challenge is that, um, yes, it may well give us a price advantage, but it may well become just part of market access. You know, the world is becoming, trade barriers are becoming increasingly um, substantial. Um, consumers are definitely wanting to know more, particularly remember we're selling to the top 5% or whatever it is of the, the global market. And that, those people want to know more about where stuff's coming from. What's its carbon footprint? What's its water story? What's its biodiversity story? And so I think even getting into those markets, thinking about biodiversity is going to become more and more important. Um, and, and, uh, and I think it's going to become part of what we as a country have to really focus on as we try and sell our stuff into the future. So that sort of brings me to the regulatory one, which is kind of like, unfortunately, the big driver at the moment to most people's thinking about biodiversity because we've had a lot of regulation thrown at us and, and there's, there's, there's more, it's ongoing, and biodiversity is part of that. So we've had water, we've had carbon, we've got biodiversity. And, and they are important, and, and um, the rights or wrongs of, of, of what government is doing, it is the reality of the world that we, we are living in. It's worth taking a step back just to remind you how it works. So we're down in Clutha District here, down here somewhere, I'm not quite sure exactly where we are on that map. Um, and the way we manage land management in New Zealand is through district councils and regional councils. District councils and regional councils have plans, you're all familiar with that. And those plans are influenced by national um, um, legislation. So at the moment, the Resource Management Act sets the frameworks. That's being replaced by the Natural and Built Environments Act, which is a new bit of legislation that's going to come in to replace the RMA. But the way that the Natural and Built Environments Act is going to work, and, and the RMA is increasingly working too, is that government is using national policy statements to set standards so the acts just create the big picture, the national policy statements set the standards, and then the councils implement those standards through their district and regional plans uh, in terms of what land management occurs on the ground. Now the important thing in national policy statements is we, we've all heard a lot about the freshwater one and we've got a biodiversity one due out at the end of the year. There's actually 10 or 12 national policy statements. They cover things like the power infrastructure for the country, um, the recent one about um, the development of high value farmland around urban centres and there are other ones out there as well. So it's not just in the farming space that there are national policy statements. Um, but national policy statements set minimum standards that every local authority has to include in their plans. And the idea is that um, there'll be a constant set of rules across New Zealand. So if you're um, farming in Southland or farming in Northland, you know, the same set of standards will apply. The thing to bear in mind is that councils can set higher standards than what's in a national policy statement. They set the minimum standard. So a particular council could decide, actually, we want to make a higher bar um, than is in the national policy statement, and they're allowed to do that. Um, so national policy statements are really, really important because they do set those standards that councils have to implement. So in the biodiversity space, we've got this national policy statement on bio or indigenous biodiversity. Um, it's been through several, it's been around for nearly 20 years now, but the current version is likely to be enacted by the end of the year. This government is determined to get it through. Um, and the key thing for you as farmers is that it's going to require all councils to identify significant natural areas. So Clutha District will have to go through and it'll have to take the criteria out of the national policy statement and go through and identify all of the significant natural areas within its district. As well as doing that, the national policy statement also requires the council to impose a defined set of rules for the management of significant natural areas. They're primarily around vegetation clearance and, and they basically limit vegetation clearance. 
but the National Policy Statement also includes rules for other, ne other native vegetation that's not in significant natural areas. And again, they, they are largely around vegetation clearance as well. But there are also rules about continuity of current use as well. But as I said, the key outcome for you as farmers, and this is not here, this is um, from um, um, Central Otago District Council, but there'll be maps like this, and within that there'll be, this is an SNA here, this is an SNA here, these are SNAs here. There'll be areas identified on the planning maps that will be significant natural areas. As far as I could tell from the Clutha District Plan, all they've identified are the areas of public conservation land. They haven't gone, so the gully up here hasn't been identified as an SNA, but it will be an SNA, I can guarantee you that. So, and even for councils like Central Otago or Kew or DC, where I am, um, where they've already done it, they're going to have to go back and check that the rules that they've used, the criteria they've used, are what is in the national policy statement and, and review it again. Um, there are a number of concerns around SNAs, which I've worked with Beef and Lamb and we, we've, we've taken the Ministry out and talked about them. Um, one of them is that the criteria for identifying SNAs are very broad. So at the moment, um, Matagari, for example, would trigger an SNA. It's, it's, it's ranked as at-risk declining. Um, and we try to point out that, look, it's really important to identify the areas that truly are significant, um, because otherwise, farmers, as farmers, you're just going to think, well, there's so much in my farm has been identified, you know, how do I know what really is important? And, and that's one of the weaknesses. Another real concern I have is that um, the, the rules at the moment, and I'm not sure they'll change these, they are primarily focused on stop and clearance. There's nothing there about the actual threats to biodiversity within the SNAs. And in particularly, there's nothing in the national policy statement about how to help you as farmers who have all this stuff to actually manage it. So that, that's a real, a real challenge, which we're still... Um, you know, challenging the Ministry on, but it, 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 it is the reality they will be coming through with, with those rules very soon. But it's worth making the point that when we talk about biodiversity, it's actually strongly related to freshwater management, the National Policy Statement on Freshwater, and it's strongly related to the stuff around carbon that's just starting to come out now, because biodiversity, freshwater and carbon, you can often manage all three of them in the same place. And, and there's a lot of synergies there, and if you think about, this is Walter Peak Station up at um, Whakatipu, you think about this wetland system down here, um, you know, there are issues there of water quality, there's, there's, there's biodiversity values there, and there's opportunities to manage it for carbon as well. So you can, you know, get all three of them together. They're not independent of each other, and I think it's important to recognise that. And if you look at the freshwater um, environmental standards for freshwater management out of the freshwater NPS, you know, it talks about... Um, uh, wetlands that are identified as significant in regional and district plans must have cattle and deer excluded by next year. Um, and then it talks about all other wetlands by 2025. And while the low slope rule hasn't been worked out yet, it's less of a biodiversity one, that'll also come through in 25. But there's major overlap here, because this often includes, um, well, this is specifically with threatened species, and these will be significant wetlands here. So there is a lot of overlap between the freshwater rules and the biodiversity. And then there is, there is increasing interest in how we can utilise native regeneration and native plantings to um, get income um, to support their management through, through carbon markets, whether it's through the ETS or whether it's through voluntary markets. So um, plantings like this, and, and you've got some nice plantings out here, potentially depending on where they fit within the rules, um, you know, depending on the width of the strips and things, can earn income. Um, from the ETS and of course there's a growing voluntary market at the moment for native, um, native regeneration and native plantings for carbon credits as well. So that brings me through to government's um, agricultural emissions, their response to the Hiwaka Ekanoa proposals released a couple of weeks ago. On the sequestration side of things, they um, proposed that they would, and this was following on from what Hiwaka Ekanoa recommended, that two categories of native vegetation uh, could earn some form of carbon credit. We're not quite sure what form it's going to be. Um, land that is wholly or predominantly native woody vegetation and the stock have been excluded from will be eligible for some form of credit, and if pest control is done, there'll be some additional credit. There's no detail yet on what that credit will be, how it will be calculated or how much it will be. Um, but for people who want to look after their native vegetation, you know, there is potentially a, an incentive in there that will allow for a credit on that. And really encouragingly too, because so much riparian planning has been done, um, and um, they talked about um, any riparian marginal planning since 2008, 
um, with, with a predominant mix of native woody vegetation would also be potentially eligible for a credit. So there are some positives in there. I know there's been a lot of debate about the, um, the, this, this document, but I, I do feel that that is quite encouraging because government is actually saying that there will be some sort of credits for managing native vegetation. Um, and I was at a conference in Wellington last week and, and uh, James Shaw was talking about um, biodiversity credits as being part of the mix. And I, I think we are seeing, you know, government is recognising that this stuff on your farms can actually be an important part of the story, but you need to be incentivised to look after it and, and some form of credit will be part of that. And I think what's also really good is that these payments will only be available to the levy payers. So uh, a district council um, that might have restoration areas can't get credits for that um, because they're not paying levies on emissions, whereas you guys are paying levies on emissions. So, so it's designed to be, be part of that levy um, system, which I think is a really positive for you. So bringing it back to biodiversity, and I'll come back to this theme again in a few minutes, but I think if, if you know what biodiversity you have on your farm, this is up the Cadrona, uh, but if you know what biodiversity is scattered across your farm and you know a bit about how it's trending through time, then you are in quite a strong position to have discussions with regulators, whether it's district councils or regional councils, uh, when they start implementing the national policy statement and, and, and start knocking on your door and wanting to talk to you about your SNAs. If you get to that situation and you are going to have a conversation with a council, I've been asked this question a few times now, what, what, what is the best way to have those discussions with council staff? Because they, they will come up the drive at some point, or we'll probably send you a letter first. Um, and I think the most important thing is to know what you have before you start the discussions. Otherwise, it's a, a one-sided discussion. If you know what you have, then you're in a better position to have that discussion. But also understand what others have in your area or catchment. I think knowing how your bit of bush or your wetland fits into the broader catchment, you know. Um, I've had a look at this bush gully up here, we're going to go this afternoon. I'd, you know, be good to know how many other bush gullies are like that. Um, what's on public conservation land next door? Um, is this the best of the best or is this actually just a degraded example? So knowing where your pit fits into that la larger landscape. Yeah, being aware of what's on public conservation land is always helpful. Being prepared to have a discussion with council staff, but making sure that, that they understand where you're trying to go with biodiversity on your farm. And I think there's this perception um, that farmers aren't interested in biodiversity, which I think is, is wrong. And I think it's really important that you dispel that. You know, make sure that the, the farm actually, that, sorry, the council staff actually understand that you, you, you do have an understanding of what you've got and you've got a vision for where you want to go. And they understand what work you're already doing because, you know, again, the perception is that you guys aren't doing anything for biodiversity. Um, you know, so, you know, Tell them about your plantings and your pest control and other things you might be doing. I always like to say, you know, even if you disagree, good relationships are really important. Um, you're never going to go anywhere with a bad relationship. Be prepared to give a bit, but obviously have a defendable bottom line um, backed up by your own biodiversity planning. So you, you, you know where you want to go, you know what you want to do, and, and you know where you can give a bit and, and where you're not prepared to give a bit. So that's the second part. There's quite a bit in there, but, um, you know, biodiversity is, is, is a is something that I think is very important to you. It's sort of come up to prominence in the last few years, but it has been bubbling away quite a bit recently. So I said, I think you're custodians of some amazing biodiversity. And I say I was blown away at what we're going to see up the valley here this afternoon. It adds value to your farming business, but it's also important from that regulatory perspective. So any questions?